Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Joseph. As he said, my name is Samuel Odiambo Otieno. Odiambo is my name. Otieno is my father. But I was here a while back, so I misused the name Otieno, so that's why that was written here. Uh, I was here between 2019 and 2021. But I'm glad I can see familiar faces, and I'm even happier that I can see new faces. Jan is high. <laughs> yeah, that means there is progress, and that's a good thing. So today, we are going to share in a topic that was sent to me, Christian disciplines. Yes, so before I begin, I came with a friend of mine who we served with him here some time back. Uh, I think some of you know him. So Jones, you can just stand and wave, and then we'll <laughs> proceed. Yeah, Jones is, Jones is a close friend of mine. We met here in the Christian Union, and our friendship has, has continued. But in back, it has not faded away even after both of us have graduated. So allow me to go straight into what brought us here today. And what brought us here today, thank you. Uh, what brought us today here today is a topic that is Christian disciplines. So we'll start by requesting us to ask how an, our neighbors, how disciplined do they, do they think they are? in whatever aspect of their lives, how disciplined do they think they are? Okay, you're right. Uh -huh. Allow me to cut you there. Uh, let not the conversation go on throughout the night, but I think the fact that we have managed to come to a midweek service shows some level of discipline. Like in we, Kifua, we are going to be humbled in, in a short while about probably how in discipline we are, or even if we are disciplined, maybe we do it for the wrong reason. So, I'm going to handle this topic under a few guides, and for those who are just taking notes, uh, I'm going to look at basic Christian disciplines and their significance. Uh, I'm going to look at the need of having a disciplined Christian life. Uh, and I'm going also to look at disciplines as being a means and not an end in themselves in the Christian walk. And lastly, I'm going to look at the gospel of Christ in the light of all this. So I'm going to combine the last two. Yes. So I looked up the definition of discipline without the word Christian in it first. So that I, I would just have a glimpse of what, of what discipline is. According to Merriam-Webster Dictionary, it says that discipline is training that corrects, that molds, and that perfects the mental faculty and moral character. Discipline that corrects, sorry, training that corrects, that perfects the mental faculty and moral character. There was an army general called George Patton, and this is what he says about discipline and obedience. He said that all human beings have an innate resistance to obedience. Just take a moment and process that. That all human beings, see whatever you to make up, we are innately resistant to obedience. And discipline removes that resistance and by constant repetition, it makes obedience a habitual and subconscious and self-respect grows directly from discipline. That all of us, as we are seated here, 
innately from birth, we are resistant to obedience. And only discipline can correct that. And I also looked up some areas where discipline is a way of life. One of them which is very common to us is the military. In this country, we refer to the military people as what? As disciplined forces. But they have been doing things that in the last few weeks, I don't want to ruffle a few feathers, allow me to pass that. Uh, another place is sport. I believe a few of us here play sport. And it requires us to train regularly, if not daily. So that at least you are able to be fit, so that if it's a football match, you don't pass out before the 90 minutes. And that requires just a lot of discipline. And then what we are handling today that also requires discipline is religion. And uh, there is Islam. Uh, those people pray a lot of times in, in one single day. We have the monks, and our faith is not left behind. Christianity also, discipline is a way of life, and that's why we are handling that topic today. Allow me to give a scriptural context of discipline in Christianity, because I believe all of us, if not all, or many of us, sorry, if not all, are Christians, and there are people in the Bible who Jesus seemed to have a big problem with. They were called the Pharisees. At that time, uh, I read the book of John way back when I was, when I started taking my Bible reading seriously. And I was humble that I told myself, if I was an Israelite, probably I would be like the Pharisees. I don't think there were people who were as disciplined as those people are. Unfortunately, they were using their discipline to show people that they were disciplined. They were just being disciplined for the sake of being disciplined. There was no reason behind their discipline. Matthew chapter 23, verse 27, when Jesus was addressing them, he told them, who unto you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of dead and everything unclean. In the same way on the outside, you appear to people as religious, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. So that is the unfortunate end of people who seemed disciplined, but their discipline, unfortunately, did not have value. So, now what are, what are Christian disciplines then? I also found a definition of Christian discipline, and I'll read it twice for those of us who are writing. So this is what di Christian discipline is. Christian disciplines are a product of the synergy between the divine and human intervention. Christian disciplines are a product of the synergy between the divine and human initiative, and they serve as a means of grace. I hope you're noting the difference between my first definition of discipline and my other definition of Christian discipline. This one is a product of synergy between the divine and the human initiative and it serves as a means of grace, not a tool of shaping. It is a means of grace so as to bring our personalities as Christians under the lordship of Christ and the control of the spirit. Allow me to read it again. The Christian disciplines are the product of a synergy between divine and human initiative, and they serve as a means of grace so as to bring our personalities under the lordship of Christ and the control of the spirit. By practicing Christian disciplines, we place our minds, our temperaments, and our bodies before God to seek his grace of transformation. So there are people among us, 
or let me not say people among us, let me say there are people who consider themselves as disciplined in the Christian way because outwardly they portray certain things. I don't know if you've seen such people. Let me give my example when I was a new Christian. Part of my Christian development happened here, and I'm glad that it did. And when I was uh, first year, second year, I would meet people who had read scripture properly, and people who would pray well. And when they would speak, scripture would just ooze out of their minds. I don't know if you've met such people. They have spent so much time with the word that you are happy and you desire to be like them. But what I learned about preparing this was that unfortunately, desiring to be like them is their own motive. Because if you are already like them, if you have the entire scripture mastered in your head, then you're already like them. But what is the reason behind why you want to be like them? And we'll look into that in a short while. So Christian disciplines, just like any other disciplines, require us to spend time. There is a, a saying, an inner saying that me and my friends have, that you have to pay your dues. You have to spend your time. Uh, I'm a creative. I don't know if there are other creatives here, but in the creative circle, we say you have to spend 10,000 hours so that you are as good as you should be. Good news, you don't have to spend 10,000 hours as a Christian, you just have to spend a bit more. The, you, you have to spend your entire life, fortunately, being a Christian. It does not end at 10,000 hours. But what I'm trying to, to, to say with that is that whether personally or corporately, you have to spend a lot of time so that you cultivate this Christian discipline. And we'll look at the reason about that in a few while. What I'm saying is also backed up by scripture. Hebrews 12 verse 1. I just hope that uh, you're also able to see the verses here because uh, I'm not looking behind, uh, but I, I, I hope they will be projected here. Hebrews 12, 11 says this. The discipline seemed pleasant at the time, but, sorry, let me take it again. No discipline seems pleasant at, at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So this is also something that struck me about Christian discipline. In as much as it is painful at the time you're doing it, but it is very beautiful because it produces a result of righteousness for everyone who has been trained by it. So what are some of the reasons why we as Christians practice discipline? Let me take a water break and give you a time to interact also, a minute or so. Just ask your neighbor, why do we, why do we practice Christian discipline? All right, uh, my water break is over, so that means you stop talking. All right, all right, all right. Uh, I'd like to, to hear a few responses of what they have said. Uh, the good thing is that I know some people in the congregation, so if I don't get responses, I'll just call some of you. But in kindness, I'm just asking for a few responses. Yes. What have they said that are some of the reasons we practice Christian discipline? So you guys were just talking a minute ago. <laughs> what were you talking about? 
I'd like to hear, even if it's, it's one response, please. All right. Okay. So, oh. Okay, to be shaped. Okay, thank you. So, some of the reasons why we practice Christian discipline. Number one, which we'll delve into in the last period of my sermon, is we practice discipline for communion with God. We practice discipline, Christian discipline, that is, for communion with God. Secondly, we practice Christian discipline to become like Christ. Christian discipline. We practice Christian discipline to become like Christ. And thirdly, we practice Christian discipline to be pruned. And pruning, what does pruning do? Pruning teaches us to leave some bad behaviors we have for the better. And it enables us to live a productive faith. I've been made aware of your, of your theme text this semester, which is John chapter 15. Isn't Yes. And uh, in the same way, uh, just to emphasize my last point on being pruned, John 15, 1 to 5 says this, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that bears fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. So Christian discipline prunes us, not just for the sake of pruning us, but so that we would be more disciplined. And then, there is also one major reason I found as to why not to practice Christian discipline. So if you are practicing Christian discipline for the reason I'm going to say, then you're not doing it for the right reason. So we do not practice Christian discipline so that we seem spiritual like the Pharisees. It's like washing outside the cup and the inside is very filthy. I know that the pressure of and, and the socialism of human beings would drive us to make us look spiritual because it will accord us some respect. But if we, but if we practice Christian discipline so that we, we may look spiritual, and boast it to others. It's even unfortunate now that we have Instagram. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying this in a bad sense. But I see people, when they are reading their Bible, they have pens and they, they cross what they've read and they share it on their Insta story. It's not wrong. But if that's the reason you're doing it, then it's unfortunate. If you look at a text in scripture and you say this will look good on Instagram, then that's unfortunate. And many of us do it. How many mimi natumia Instagram different? Many of us do it. And people just do it so that others will see. It means we're just the modern day Pharisee. And that's, that's very unfortunate. Uh, I looked at some of the Christian disciplines that exist. And there are different scholars who categorized this Christian discipline into, into portions. Some say there are two portions of Christian discipline. Some say there are, there are three. They do not differ on the definition. They just differ on the, on the specifics, which is not a, a, a huge thing. But the two major portions that I was able to disagree with were that in Christian disciplines, there are those disciplines that are practiced sorry, in solitude. There are those disciplines that you practice alone when nobody is watching. Like prayer, like personal Bible study, though both also cut across to those that are practiced corporately when people are seeing. So there are also others that are now practiced corporately when people are seeing. 
One of them is what we're doing today, fellowship. Another one is corporate Bible study. Another one is corporate prayer. So there are many Christian disciplines. Allow me to mention a few. If you had them in mind, I believe they're correct. Failure to mention them does not mean that it is Christian discipline. It is not, sorry, Christian discipline. I just mentioned a few. Bible study, meditation, worship, fasting, solitude, fellowship service, evangelism, journaling, missionary work, and many more. So the many more are those ones that exist, but for the context of this, I'll, I did not mention them. So I'd just like us to go through a few of them that I know are practiced here, and we'll just go through the essence of them. So one of them is prayer. And Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5.17 tells us to do what? To pray continually. Other version says to pray without, to pray without ceasing. That's nice. The second one is fasting. But this one also, ilikuwa inafanana na ile ya Pharisees ya kuosha nje ya kikombe. I think you know what scripture says about this. It says in Matthew 6, 16 to 18, when you fast, okay, there is no people who study literature in Zeikwa. Tuwako kweli? Probably people who study journalism, but when means that it should happen. Not if you fast. When you fast. So I wanted to say that I believe all of us do it, but I, I, I do not know, but I pray that you do it. Because I'm aware that you people have prayer days and prayer weeks, right? And you are currently even in a season of 100 days of prayer, is it? So I believe in apokatikati kuna watu wana wana take time to fast. Let me go to what I was saying. Matthew 6, 16 to 18. When Jesus is talking about fasting, this is what he says. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. For they disfigure their face to show others they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast... Put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your father who is unseen and your, and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Allow me to say one thing. I don't know if you're seeing a trend as we are heading where we are heading as far as Christian discipline is concerned. That there is a reason why we do it. There is a reason why we do it, and the reason is not people. Inasmuch as our Christian disciplines will minister to our Christian brethren, but you should not at any point say that if you if you do it, you're doing it for people. You shouldn't. You should be doing it for God. And God requires that whatever we have, we use it to serve other people. I will expound on what I'm saying as we go forward. The second Christian discipline is Bible study, both corporate and personal. So Bible reading and Bible study is the place of continually reading God's word. I think you should note that word. Continually reading God word, God's word, sorry, personally and corporately because God's word is the ultimate guide for the Christian life. If you've been in these circles for long enough, there is a word that is said, the scripture is infallible. I will let you look for that meaning by yourself. But Joshua, in Joshua 1.8, this is what he says 
about that discipline, that keep this book of the law always on your lips, meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do what? To do everything that is written in it. So the reason we read the Bible is not to look well read. We read the Bible so that we do what is written in it. And then we will be prosperous and successful. Scripture talks about a person who knows the word and does not do it. And what does scripture compares what does scripture compare them to? A man who looks at himself in the mirror and then after they have looked, they forget. And that's unfortunate. In the same breath of doing what is written in scripture, Psalm 119, verse 11 said, says, I have hidden your word in my heart so that I will not sin against you. Uh, there are other disciplines that I combined, which are three of them. One is fellowship, two is service, and three is accountability. So fellowship, uh, these are avenues where we meet, we worship, and we share in the breaking of bread and encouraging one another in faith. Hebrews 10.25 tells us, that not giving up in meeting together, some of you are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. We have another discipline that is service. This is where we serve the body of Christ, which is the church, with our gifts and our abilities and our time and our resource. And I've seen many of you do it here. Uh, you serve by serving in the music ministry, serving in the Sunday school ministry, doing design, doing sound, doing evangelism, all those things. And when you're still a student, I would highly, highly advise that you at least plug into a ministry or two, or even three if you can because you will really be, be built as a Christian. Ephesians 4, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 12 says this, that he gave some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry and edifying the body of Christ. And also Ephesians 416 just gives a, a glimpse of how we are different parts of the body of Christ, but we are fitly joined together so that every ligament would supply so that, oh, I'll just allow me to read it, from the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies according to the effectual working in the measure of every path, of every part, make it increase in the body, edifying itself in love. And the other one is accountability. So accountability, I know you're familiar with this term, and I just like to put a caution. That accountability is not policing. So that you are constantly on your sister's or your brother's neck, it's not policing. That is not what accountability is. At Accountability is not that. Accountability should come from a point of care for oneself and for the brethren in the fellowship. That is where accountability should come from. So that if I am truly concerned with your scripture, if I am truly concerned with your mannerism, if I am truly concerned with your life, 
that is where accountability comes from. And even when I am sharing, even when I am seeking to, 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 to share, I am not getting information from you so that I will shame you. I am getting information from you so that if there is anything wrong or if there is anything that is good, I pray with you so that God will continually guide you. James chapter 5 verse 16 encourages us to actually develop this discipline. It says that therefore confess your sins one, for an one to another and do what? And pray for one another. So it comes from a point of, of care. We are not policemen for each other. We are brothers and sisters and that is where accountability should come from. It also says as it ends, that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So I want to go to the last two parts of the sermon. And I would like the person projecting to assist me and put Ephesians 2. I'm going to read from verse 1 to 9. Right. Can I go ahead and read? Thank you. Ephesians 2 from verse 1 to 9 says this. That as for you, you were dead in your transgressions, in which you used to live when you followed the, when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us who lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following the desires of our thoughts, like the rest, we were by nature deserving wrath. But because of his love for us, God who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgression. And it is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Again, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith and not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. When I was thinking about the connection of Christian disciplines and scripture, the first thing that came to mind was Timothy 4. But when I came across Ephesians 2, I was just taken aback to where all of us who are Christians came from before we decided to pursue this path called Christianity. The Bible does not sugarcoat its communication on the state we were in before we got born again. And Ephesians 2 is rather direct because it says that we were what? We were dead in our transgressions. Just take a minute to, to reflect about your situation so that when you approach Christian discipline, I think we will approach it with the utmost care. There, was a, there is a professor who is called D.A. Carson and he says that to pursue unmediated knowledge of God is to announce that the person of Christ and his, his sacrificial work on our behalf are not necessary for the knowledge of God. I think you understand the word to mediate. To mediate, a mediator is someone who comes between you and another person. 
So scripture says that Christ is our mediator between us and God. So to practice these Christian disciplines in a way that is unmediated, in simple terms to say to practice Christian disciplines without Christ, is to say that his sacrificial work is useless. And if I or others have found ourselves in this position, it is rather unfortunate. And I just pray that God will show us that the reason we do all this is because Christ died on the cross. I know seeming to be Christian, seeming to have these Christian disciplines will give you a beautiful outward appearance. But it is unfortunate that without Christ, that is all futile. The truly transformative element in the Christian discipline is not the discipline itself. You see, the constant doing of the things we do, the constant praying, the constant, that is not the transformative element. The transformative element is the worth we put on that discipline that is what transforms us. You should pray daily, you should read your Bible daily, because reading your Bible daily is important. You should place a lot of words in whatever you're doing. I know many a times, and personally, I have also been caught in that trap, that, some, that sometimes when you do something continuously or repeatedly, in a kuwakama, kama normality, isn't it? So when you come out of Bible, you're like, oh, I'm trying so much journey, just to check a box. But 1 Corinthians 10, 12 tells us that if anyone thinks he stands, let him check himself, lest he falls. If any one of us thinks, because tunaza kwa tumeifanya several times until we think we are on the right path. But I would advise that regularly we should have an introspect and that is why accountability is important to oneself and to the body of Christ. So that when we think we are in the safe path, let's just check ourselves to ensure that we are not shaken. Because we have mastered these things, and I know many of us have. I know there are many of us in this congregation who pray for long hours. I know them, there are many of us in this congregation who have read the Bible several times. But we should not forget that it is God who enables us to do this. We do not do this in our own power. And scripture says that in, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 to 13. This is what Philippians 12 to 13 says. That Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is who? For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. We do not practice these Christian disciplines because you are capable. It is God who enables us to do it. And every time in humility, whether we think we stand, we should constantly go in acknowledgement just to realize that it is God who enabled us. Uh, you can project Ephesians 2 uh, as I conclude. So there is something, I think you've had a sermon on it called justification. Does anyone know what the word means? 
Okay. But I believe some of us do. So when I was reading Ephesians 2, justification is where all of us come from. All of us were sinners by default. I think we believe that. It's unfortunate if you believe that you were born a good person. We are not. We are born sinners from birth. But Christ, through his grace, as Ephesians, as Ephesians says in Ephesians 2, 8, Ephesians 2, verse 8, it is by grace that we have been saved through faith. So we have been saved by grace and then we believe and it is not of ourselves. It is the gift of God himself. So that even as we practice our Christian discipline, it should root from a point that we know that Christianity in itself that we get to enjoy is actually a gift. I think we, do, we should even be thanking God continually for enabling us to see ourselves as the sinners we are and going to him in faith so that he sanctifies us. So justification, as I said, is a free gift. There is a verse that qualifies it that I will not read, but you can just have it down for, for your notes. It's all right. It's 1 Corinthians 6, 8 to 11. And then, after justification, there is another word called sanctification. I also hope that you have heard a topic about that here. If not, I'm very sure it will happen before you get to leave this place. But sanctification, because it is continuous, now sanctification is the path that enables us to practice all these Christian disciplines. The process of sanctification enables us daily to be like Christ and then in the end when now we will be given new bodies that will not struggle with praying for one hour we will be glorified. So justification is where we came from and then sanctification is the path where we practice our Christian disciplines and as Ephesians says Christian disciplines, sorry, as Ephesians says, we were saved by grace and we did not do anything to be saved. I want to conclude by saying this, that Christian disciplines at whatever instant, should be practiced with the utmost care and the utmost humility. If you're a Christian, you know that scripture talks very negatively of pride. Even if you're bringing other people to be as disciplined as you are, you should practice it with utmost care. Unfortunately, I have been in circles where people say, I don't know if you have been in those circles. And I say, man, when in Christ, struggle even a prayer. It's like they're trying to nullify your Christianity. I don't know if you have met such people. That is not the attitude that we should approach Christian discipline. And even if we are consistent in praying, we should pray with it in the back of our minds that what we are doing is utmost communion with the Lord we worship and with the Lord we serve. And my prayer for every one of us, including myself this evening, is that as we practice 
this Christian discipline. That the Lord will prune everything that is wrong in our lives and he will continually make us be like himself. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this evening. Thank you for teaching us about Christian discipline. Thank you for the gift of Christianity and for the gift of salvation that probably none of us deserve. Because in our own life, we are wretched. In our own life, we are messed up. But by your grace, you have called us and you have given us the opportunity to be your children. Father, we pray that as we practice this Christian discipline, we'll practice them with the utmost care. We'll practice them with the utmost value. Father, we will see prayer as a place where we come to you genuinely in fellowship. We will see Bible reading as a place where we come to you for instruction. And as we do all this, O oh Lord, we pray that you may enable us to follow your precepts and be like you. So that when we are glorified in the last day, we will worship in your presence and we will see you as you are for the glory and for the honor of your name. We thank you, we adore you, and we bless your name. In Jesus' name I pray, trusting and believing. Amen. Thank you very much.